thank you very much indeed for inviting me to speak to you. Uh, I feel very humble here because I'm surrounded by so many people who actually know uh, something about what they're talking about, which is which is not me at all, but um, please bear with me. And I really want to thank not only you, Steve, for inviting me, but also Philippa for dealing with a technically quite challenged presenter here today. Uh, and she has worked wonderfully to smooth this. So I'm sure it'll go fine. But also Ellen Lee, who always responds so enthusiastically when she gets the wildlife video clips that um, I send you from time to time from Waterstock. Well, I'm the lucky owner of Waterstock Mill, uh, which if we can see the photograph, uh, Philippa, uh, is a tiny uh, former water mill on the River Tame, um, perched precariously on an island uh, on the River Tame, uh, located very close to junction 8A of the M40 um, motorway. And this view is taken upstream of the mill and as you'll see, the water goes both sides of it. Uh, on the right uh, is a wooden weir, uh, which has been there for a very long time, but is an obstacle to fish, which is one of the projects that we've had to overcome. But that's Waterstock uh, Mill in the good times when the sun is shining and there's not much rain. Um, the building goes back to 1693, although there's been a mill here since Norman times. It's a rather crazy place to live, as you can see uh, from this photograph. Uh, this is obviously when the rivers are high. Um, we've not been flooded yet. Uh, and the reason for that is that there is a very, very extensive uh, floodplain uh, all the way up to the right, which is north towards uh, Water Perry. And that is our salvation. As I say, we've not been flooded yet. And allegedly it's never flooded. And the, the mill's been here, as I say, from Norman times. But it's precisely this flooding um, that makes Waterstock quite a special place uh, for wildlife. And which is what I'll be talking about today. We had absolutely no idea uh, when my family and I moved here 25 years ago um, that there was anything interesting about wildlife at all here. And the River Tame uh, has a reputation uh, really for being very boring and uh, in, in a sense a sort of wildlife desert. So when we, when we arrived here we had no idea what we were to expect, although there were some early pointers the National Rivers Authority, as it was then called, and later the Environment Agency carried out fish surveys, always with good results. And Graham Scully, who I'm sure quite a few of you will know at the Environment Agency, began telling us enthusiastically that otters would arrive soon. And he also told us where exactly we should expect to see them. And Graham's predictions um, turned out to be spot on. And then, happy day, along comes a certain Nick Mariner of the River Tame Conservation Trust to commence his monthly bird surveys. And as you can see in this photograph, which just come up, which is from the wooden weir, which was on the north side or the right of the mill, you can see the very extensive floodplain uh, right at the top in the distance is Waterbury House and Gardens, and that's very, very broad. So Nick came to begin his surveys about six years ago uh, on, on a monthly basis, and uh, we'll be speaking uh, later. Uh, Nick is the River Tame wildlife godfather. Um, none of this would have really got going without his enthusiasm, uh, expert knowledge, and support and uh, sheer persistence and um, uh, all, all the rest of it, obstinacy and all the rest of it. Uh, so it's terrific. So today, Waterstock is designated as a local wildlife site and also as, import, as an important freshwater area. And the River Tame is perhaps no longer regarded quite as the wildlife desert that it once was. Nick's pioneering 
bird surveys have been followed by other surveys, including river flies, which Roger will be speaking about in a moment, and botany, where another Roger, Roger Heath Brown, discovered that we have the nationally rare and mysterious parasitic greater dodder all over the place. There have been moth surveys by Peter Alfrey and several other surveys. And anyone participating at this conference today who would think of doing other species surveys at Waterstock would be really, really welcome. And I'm quite in awe of what we saw earlier uh, from the earlier presentation by Helen. Um, she's obviously done so much more than, than we have. The approach that I take to the 10 acres of land surrounding the mill is to leave it alone, uh, to be as wild as it naturally wants to be. And about eight acres of it is floodplain like this. So there's not much I could do even if I wanted to. And the River Tame Conservation Trust has done some really wonderful work um, to enhance the habitat. Uh, first of all, as I said earlier, the wooden weir is a barrier to fish. And so they've um, engineered an old back ditch uh, to be a sort of fish bypass um, to get round um, the weir. Uh, and also the River Tame Conservation Trust has constructed some inlets uh, from the river where fish can breed. And all of this has had a tremendous impact on uh, on the fish stock here, which gets better and better. And lastly, and another important factor is that my son James is a wildlife uh, filmmaker who showed me how to install trail cameras around uh, the grounds. And these have definitely helped raise awareness uh, about the, uh, the riches, the wildlife riches here at, at Waterstock and public awareness of the site. I now have six cameras scattered around the property, uh, five in fixed locations, uh, one which I move about depending on what's going on at the time. Sometimes uh, they're on poles in the river and sometimes they fall into the river. So it, it can be quite an expensive hobby and I've lost one or two cameras as a result of that. Anyway, to try and show you uh, what um, video clips have been taken and uh, uh, Ellen very kindly uh, put some of them up earlier. Uh, here is a, what follows now is a short compilation uh, of video clips which was put together by my son James who also filmed the opening sequence of the Waterstock Curlews which Nick will be telling you more about I'm sure in, in a minute. So Philippa if you could see the um,
So thanks, Henry, for your introductory words and Steve and, and all for inviting us today to speak. Um, so my name is Nick Mariner, I'm a volunteer uh, trustee with the Riverton Conservation Trust. And I guess I've completely lucked out um, in my in my picking of a, of a site to carry out my monthly wetland bird survey that we carry out across the whole of the river at Waterstock. Um, so Henry, thanks for your, your kind words. I guess if ever there was an example of an enthusiastic, passionate landowner um, and a great collection of trail cameras, it's you. So thank you for all your support in the last um, six years to get to where we are now, really, which I hope is the beginnings of something um, something really special at, at Waterstock. So my job really is I guess to give a quick, really whistle-stop tour. I'm conscious we maybe need to catch up on a little bit of time, but um, I guess it's a story of the power of local recording in underwatched areas, um, really. I know Sergio speak before, that's kind of a bit of a passion of mine, but it's really born out in, in water stock. Um, so we, as a River Tame Trust, Conservation Trust, we have a wetland bird so we carry it every month across the whole river. And you can see from the map here, water, uh, water stock is just at the where the river kind of bends down to go southwest under the, the M40 there. So, so a bit of context there, this is one of a number of wetland bird survey sites across the whole of the river that I've been fortunate to carry out. And since we started with six years next month, and we're now 123, I think it's actually 124 species we've recorded on site, which for a small little out the way site is, is fantastic. So Philip, if you could move me on, please. So just to kind of highlight the importance, I guess, really, this graph here is on the left hand side to go running across the bottom axis. You have all the different sites running um, from source to mouth. And I've highlighted their water stock um, and my survey sector in, in red. And it just shows the number of species recorded there, just how important water stock is in the context of the whole river. We have a couple of very important sites around Aylesbury and Ethrop, and then a cluster of sites between Shavington and just say cross over into the Oxfordshire um, area around water stock itself. So, so really kind of highlighting the monthly surveys, really highlighting just how important water stock is not only for the birds that, that use there and winter there or breed there, but is in the rest of the whole context of the river and the floodplain on the river itself. So. So again, the survey is really starting to show that prior before we started, we really didn't really have that kind of understanding. So really, really kind of importance, but really homing in on water perry is the core area where we have the, the really exciting bird life. Um, Philippa, please. Thank you. So from a birding perspective, I'll walk you through a few bits here, but also from a birder's perspective, which I am, and I guess a number of us on the call are as well. We've had some amazing records. You can't necessarily claim they've been using water stock, I suppose, in a way of somewhere, but but in terms of the area and one thing through, um, so we had fly over Gannett um, a couple of years ago. I remember, we had a real hawfinch eruption. We've had hawfinches at um, at water stock. Uh, Wimbrel is pretty much an annual record at water stock in in the spring um, coming through. We've had regular sightings of Merlin. We've had marsh area through, and on some of the floods when we've had taken the time to work through the gulls, we've even found a, a kitty wake. Um, coming through so it it packs a punch from a birding site of course it does and there's some brilliant birds there for the birders to get the birders interested but Philip if you can move us on it's really in its regular floodplain interest where really water stock does come into its own so as anyone was talking there around in the bad times in the flood well actually we do have this conversation quite a bit actually that's when I started to get very excited watch the weather forecast watch the rain if the river comes over I get very excited on my Sunday mornings when I come down and just to highlight, last winter, we had a very wet winter. There's very long levels of flood, but, but our counts of, of widgeon, uh, top left there, are over a thousand widgeon on one visit. We've had getting close to, well, just under um, 1,500 um, teal on one visit. I'm well, saying visit this is now, and amazingly, 105 pintail. Uh, now, these are the kind of numbers you'd expect to see on Otmore or some of the other kind of um, bigger areas around Oxfordshire, um, not on lowly, out of the way, water stock. When the flood's in, in, in good form, it really does pack a punch from, from the scale of wintering wildfowl that it does hold. Um, very exciting times down there. You can't always walk around the site, and my son and I have quite often swam and got up to our waist in ridge and furrow and various things coming around. That's all kind of the fun of, I guess, searching for, for wildfowl in the winter on water stock. So, so incredibly important from a floodplain perspective. And Philippa, please, if you could move us, uh, move us through. But equally, um, some of the spectacles in the winter, again, we've had big numbers of lapwing flocks, mixed lapwing gold and plover flocks. Uh, last winter, we had a single count on one visit, 189 snipe, which is just incredible to see as they all kind of pop up. And on that same count, three jack snipe. Who knows if there may have been more. 
um, very difficult to, to, to count Jack Snyder from from where. But but in terms of, of from a spectacle perspective, it's stunning. When you get a nice, clear, crisp winter morning, and you just hear the lapwing flocks and the golden plover going up and the squelching of the snipers they pop up. It's a very very fantastic sight. Very privileged to have the chance to to survey there. Uh, Philippa, please. So, so going back, with this probably going back about three years now, we were uncovering these records and every time we went, we were finding more and, and breed, similar kind of breeding records in the spring. And Henry and I were chatting, well, is there something we can do with this? We've, we've kind of uh, unearthed something here that we didn't really expect to find. And kind of long story short, we spoke to Julie, um, Julie and Pim, and thank you for your support, Julie and Pim, in, in getting to this stage here around the possibility of, of looking to see if we could get Waterstock designated as a local wildlife site. So Julie very kindly came out and carried out various surveys. We submitted records and over a couple of years of going from proposed local wide site, wildlife site, very excited to, to receive the news that the site was actually formally designated um, probably a couple of years ago now, um, which is real testament to the, to the, to the, just the exciting range of habitat, I guess, and, and the wintering birds that do come, come and use water stock itself. So, so we're, we're what, two years in now, I think, to being a, a local wildlife site. And still the site carries on to, um, to, to prove interest and to pack a punch. So Philip, if you could move me through, please. Cool. So, so having the local wildlife site thing is great. It's brilliant and it is fantastic. The records are, are amazing. It really does start to raise the profile of not just the site, but the river. Uh, but from a river tame conservation trust perspective, I guess the key word there in the conservation bit, we were keen to to work with Henry and also the, so the, the wildlife site is a combination of two, two land and ship parcels, um, Stephen Shipley as well, a, a slightly larger site, a little bit further upstream from the mill at Waterstock. So talking about what we can do from a, from a habitat perspective to help improve the site even further. So Henry talked about the fish pass and the work that we've done in the river at the mill, but equally, this is about a year ago now, um, we carried out some works to crater Kind of scrape come fish refuge which you can see on the left hand side the left hand two photos there so a big um, backwater fish refuge which is also doubles up as lots of extra mud and muddy edges for our for our wading birds in the winter but also we work with freshwater habitats trust and um and worked with the, the rotary ditcher there the, the xrsb rotary ditcher and cut a new series a network of scrapes on on Stephen Shipley's land as well which on the first survey after them being cut actually we had a green sandpiper pop up from them. so proving their worth straight away so so this whole kind of story from the first records to your first video cameras of otters Henry through to to local wildlife status designation to now doing practical habitat conservation works it's it's been a brilliant story really of collaboration I guess between the trust and yourself Henry on the ground and really making a difference for for the wildlife in that in the local patch so lots of practical work and Philip if you could move me on please um but equally Henry made there and in the video you saw clips of, of the curly the water stock and the and the floodplain up upstream from Henry is still the one of the the main areas in on the river Tame for our breeding curly so we still have curly breeding on, in two sites on the on the mid Tame water stock and the Shabbington area so it's been brilliant to be able to use our surveys to to keep tabs on what's happening to the to curly. We haven't been able to prove breeding or otherwise. We're not there often enough, but but keeping tabs on the birds can make sure they're coming back. And we've had um, on average the last four to five years, either between six and eight birds returning and potentially possible, probable. We're never quite sure we can nail it down, but breeding still on site and at Shabbington as well. So so really kind of important that the surveys and the work we're doing on the ground are keeping tabs on on our curly as well. So. Actually, Philip, you can move me through the next slide. It's kind of saying the same thing, but in the context of the whole Upper, Tame area, the Upper Thames area, just kind of shows, I guess, the context and the importance of, of water stock and of Shavington in, the, in that same patch. And I guess this slide kind of talks the same thing. So maybe move through that if we can. To the next slide, please. Into my Chris Whitty thing. So, so lots of the story there of, of records, of practical habitat work, of the designation, of keeping tabs on our, on our breeding curly, but equally, and this is testament again to Henry and your on your video work, but actually you managed to capture here. And if we could just play the video, Philip, please, that would be brilliant. Just a very short video clip there, but the birders of you in the audience there will be get very excited that actually there's a there's a goosander, um, and they've been. Bread. We can't pinpoint these actual nests, but um, from the size of the chicks and the time they've come out and the regularity of, of the coverage, we're pretty confident they've bred 
in, and that will be the first breeding record of goosander in Oxfordshire. So speaking to the county bird recorder, he doesn't know from any records that there's ever been proven breeding evidence of goosander in, in Oxfordshire, let alone on the River Tame before. So, so fantastic day to capture these. Uh, we've been able to pick them up on our surveys as well and follow them through to, to maturity and fledging as well. So it just shows again the power of picking up on, on these kind of records as we go through. So it's so an incredible sight for all kinds of different reasons. Um, but I guess equally, and, and finishing off, and before I hand over to Roger, if we can move on to my last slide, um, Philippa, please, that all this work is now starting to culminate in, say, the, the water stock and the tame being recognised more. And it's great to see when um, when the Draft Nature Recovery Network was launched, it was probably getting on the best part of a year ago now, wasn't it, as well? They're actually, the tame is now in water stock area, and that kind of whole area upstream is now featuring as some of the core zones in the nature recovery or the proposed nature recovery network, which which is brilliant to see because we we know we love the patch we know we love the river we feel it's undervalued um very definitely undervalued and un, under um i guess under under loved i guess it's probably one way of looking at it. but now the work we've been doing at waterstock and other areas and there's another site just upstream that's been designated as local wildlife site in buckinghamshire too starting to now literally put waterstock literally on the map which we hope will actually lead to, to more recognition and more things coming down the road, just how important the area is. So, so a big thank you to you, Henry, and to Stephen for all your support. Um, and a real key message, really, if you look, you find. And if you find things happen, and I guess that's probably the mantra of our, our work on the team. So incredibly exciting site. And um, so that's been a bit of a whistle stop tour. And um, I'll hand over to you, Roger, for your um, your talk on your work and the water stock on, on the river fly monitoring. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I will now try and bring up my screen. Uh, and I should share that. The River Tame Conservation Trust has been encouraging uh, river fly monitoring at Waterstock Mill. Now, this talk is going to complement some of the work that Anna Forbes described about the candidate yesterday. Um, the uh, uh, river fly monitoring is designed uh, as a method of monitoring uh, water quality within rivers um, by looking at the uh, eight target species of river fly invertebrates uh, and monitoring their numbers and this gives a way of detecting any uh, water quality uh, changes and what quality incidents and if there are incidents where numbers decline, it also gives you a way of finding out roughly where the incident has taken place. And then the observers, if there is a, a reduction below a, a set target level, then inform the relevant environmental organisation in that particular area. Uh, now there's a network of programs that's in the River Tame catchment, but this is a, a national uh, uh, setup and you can see all the green dots are observers and uh, the presence of observers really indicates the presence of active um, river conservation organizations who, who push uh, their river fly monitors uh, what we do is a three minute kick sample the observers count and record the number of the target species and the number of species and the overall numbers of each species is reduced to an overall score which is compared with a trigger value and uh, the sampling is normally carried out monthly uh, records if anybody's interested in the records the records are available from the river fly partnership for all sites uh, the target species involve um, uh, caddis fly larvae mayflies uh, and all, all species that you can see listed there um, now Waterstock Mill or the River Tame is a typical lowland river and we find mayfly cased in cases Canis gamorous but we have uh, an occasional surprise appearance of heptagenidae. Um, when we were receiving our training they said you won't catch in the Tame you won't catch any heptagenidae they said because heptagenidae are only found in upland fast flowing rivers. Um, but one of the habitats that we, we uh, monitor is a fast flowing section along by the mill uh, and the suspicion is that this provides a micro habitat for the 
Dr. Jenny Dye, which just shows the importance of the microhabitats uh, and what you can find in them. Uh, now, what we try and do is identify, not only just record the eight target species, we try and record anything that we can, we can uh, identify. Uh, and then if you want to know what heptagendi look like, uh, this is what they are. Uh, and they're designed to survive in fast growing streams. And I think that, that sort of ends a very quick tour of they, all the pleasant things at Waterstock Mill. Uh, can I say, if anybody is interested in river fly monitoring, it's um, uh, my wife and I really enjoy doing, uh, and it's very pleasant. And the Waterstock Mill provides a very uh, uh, charming backdrop to the work that we do.